Hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, we're very excited uh, to have uh, Professor Deepa Thomas uh, here today from uh, University of Texas at Austin. Um, Deepa got her PhD um, in 2014 from uh, Utrecht University on um, heavy flavor uh, uh, correlations in uh, PGP. Um, she then uh, became a postdoc and later an associate research scientist at uh, University at Texas at Austin before uh, she started her assistant uh, professor position um, um, just this uh, summer also at uh, Texas Austin. Um, Deepa is an expert in heavy flavor analyses. Uh, she, uh, she was previously the uh, heavy flavor physics analysis group coordinator for leptons from heavy flavor uh, decays, and she's now uh, the, PAC, the physics analysis group coordinator for uh, heavy flavor correlations uh, within ALICE. Uh, in addition to uh, physics, she's previously been a junior representative in ALICE, and she is now the deputy team leader for, uh, for Austin. Um, yeah, so uh, Deepa's going to tell us today about probing track PCP with charm and beauty quirks. Thank you, Laura. Okay. So, yeah, as uh, Laura said, I'll talk about how can we talk that the charm and beauty quirks are used to probe. Uh, QGP and what we uh, learned from the, the current measurements we have in Alice, the Alice detector, and uh, what we will uh, uh, what more to learn uh, in the coming uh, years. So um, just to introduce, uh, so we know that we have been using high energy heavy ion collisions to produce coagulant plasma, which is a state of deconfined matter where quarks and gluons. Uh, can travel a distance larger than the hydraulic scale. So, and we have been using different facilities from the 90s, at, uh, starting from SPS and RIC and now at the LHC, very different properties of coagulant plasma. And some of the unique features about coagulant plasma that we know that we have seen from, uh, from the experiments are uh, uh, jet quenching, where we see high momentum particles uh, lose energy as they travel through the medium. And then we also seen that the produced coagulant plasma uh, is strongly interacting, and uh, and they can be described by hydrodynamic model, which uh, describes QGP as an ideal uh, fluid with very low shear viscosity and density ratio. And the density of QGP is high enough that uh, heavier quarks, such as strange quarks, can be produced thermally. But all of these um, properties and all the understanding of the properties comes from a macroscopic perspective. What we want to know is how QCD interactions at a more microscopic level lead to the emer these emergent phenomena, right? So we, we, we want to go look deeper or probe QGP at a smaller length scale and investigate uh, the properties of uh, QGP. So to do this, we can use high energy particles or higher mass particles uh, to because we are basically looking Q, at QGP uh, microscopically. So heavy quarks, the charm and beauty quarks are excellent probes to do this. Why? Uh, heavy quarks, because they are heavy mass, they are produced um, in hard scattering process early in the, uh, in the collision, so the early stages of the collision. And in the hard scattering process, so because uh, because the mass is, uh, is quite high, and the production can be calculated using perturbative techniques. So this is uh, extremely useful uh, theoretically to calculate the production, which makes it a calibrated probe. And then as heavy quarks interact with the QGP, which is produced later after the production of heavy quarks, the, the heavy quarks interact uh, via collisional uh, processes or by uh, radiating gluons in the process, so they lose energy. But at low PT, we can even think of the, uh, the motion of heavy quarks in the, in the QGP uh, like a Brownian motion. So uh, we can uh, extract spatial diffusion coefficients uh, using uh, low PT uh, heavy quarks. And because of the higher mass, again, they tend to lose uh, less energy compared to light quarks. So we can study uh, if there are any mass or flavor effects uh, in, the, in the energy loss. And finally, because again, because of the mass effects, the probability of heavy quarks being uh, created in the coagulant plasma or being destroyed in the coagulant plasma is very less, so they don't annihilate. So their identity gets preserved while after even um, to the full process. So if we tag 
or if we look at uh, the heavy flavor hadrons, we can basically look back uh, in the whole process to the original uh, uh, heavy quarks. So that, these are the reasons why heavy quarks are quite interesting to, to study. So the way we study heavy quarks uh, by looking at the hadrons. So there are two different ways. One is by looking at open heavy flavor uh, hadrons. This is when uh, heavy quarks hadronize with a light quark, so it's such as D mesons and B mesons. And with and the other way is uh, looking at quarkonia or hidden uh, heavy quarks, so such as JHI and upsilon, where uh, they are made of CC, they are bound CC bar or BB bar states. Now, these two ways gives us complementary information, um, and we can study different aspects of heavy flavor interactions with uh, quark gluon plasma. So, for example, with open heavy quarks, we can study uh, mass dependent effects more directly uh, and uh, also study the fragmentation and, and uh, hadronization mechanism in the, in the presence of the medium. While quarkonia, uh, in the presence of QGP, they undergo color screening so they can uh, undergo suppression. Uh, but also they can recombine in later states. So these are effects that can be studied using uh, quarkonia states. So in this talk, I'll focus more on the on open heavy flavor hadrons, uh, but I will also show some results from quarkonia as a comparison to, to, to see what we can, or to get full information on what's happening or how heavy quarks interact with the with PT. And experimentally, um, we can we reconstruct heavy flavor hadrons by uh, measuring the decay particles. So heavy quarks decay very fast. So what we experimentally can identify are the, the final decay products. For example, charm and beauty quark or beauty quarks decay to electrons. We can use that, or we can reconstruct uh, the full decay kinematics of uh, D mesons, for example, in the kaon and pion, which is one of the decay channels. So these are the different ways that we can experimentally uh, reconstruct heavy uh, heavy flavor hadrons and then study uh, study them. So just for non heavy emphasis or younger audience, so um, when we study any property of plasma, we use heavy ion collisions. But in order to do that, we need to have a reference or a baseline measurement, and for this, we use proton proton collisions. So this is a system where the uh, where we don't expect QGP to be uh, to be produced. So um, the measurement that we perform in AA collisions would be with, the uh, with the reference to the the baseline system, and that will give us information of how what are the effects of uh, QGP. But of course, a, a nucleus is not the same is not same as proton proton or a scale version of proton proton collisions. So there are there are other cold nuclear matter effects. Um, such as uh, the environment itself, the quarks and gluons are in a nuclear environment, which will change the, the pattern distribution functions uh, and others, other effects, uh, which can be studied using proton uh, nucleus collisions. So there are some measurements uh, that I will show later on, which uh, where I go from proton proton to uh, proton uh, lead collisions and then A collisions to see how uh, uh, things evolve. Okay, so uh, the measurements that I'll show today are from the Alice experiment. So many of you know the Alice experiment, but just to uh, just to note that the uh, results that I will show here are uh, use some of the um, components of this detector, so mainly the inner tracker system uh, for primary vertex uh, reconstruction and event characterization. The time protection chamber is used for tracking and particle identification. We have uh, time of flight, which is used for particle identification. And the electromagnetic calorimeter again for particle identification. So these detectors are used to identify final state particles such as kaon, pion, proton, electron, and neon, which can then be used to construct heavy flavor uh, hydrons. Okay, so what I'm going to talk today about um, basically I'll show four different kinds of measurements and what we can what we have learned from these measurements. So the first measurement that I talk about is the azimuthal anisotropy or VN. Uh, and what uh, we can and what we've learned from the heavy flavor VN measurements and nuclear modification factor or RAA, an angular correlation of heavy flavor particles, and finally uh, about hadronization uh, using heavy quarks. So, um, firstly, we know that as I mentioned, the coagulant plasma was seen to um, interact very strongly and they collectively flow. So the observable used is the azimuthal distribution of particles in the plane perpendicular to the beam axis. 
And it is seen that this is sensitive to the early dynamics uh, of the collision. Why? Uh, because if we consider a semi-central nucleus nucleus collisions where they do not overlap, so we have a, an isotropy in the produced system, so something like an album shape in a simplistic way. And the, the density of the produced cold ion plasma is quite high at the center with vacuum outside. So this creates a huge pressure gradient. So this expands rapidly. And as it expands rapidly, the system evolves and the initial anisotropy uh, in the system translates into a momentum anisotropy. So here is an example uh, or, a, or a demonstration using ultra cold atoms to see uh, how a pressure driven uh, expansion um, uh, goes as a function of time. So you see that a system which, which begins uh, looking like this ends up looking like this. And now if we take, if we look at the particle distribution as a, let's say, uh, if we take this as the axis and we plot the angular distribution of particles, we see a distribution like this. And if we do a Fourier coefficient or for, uh, decomposition of this distribution, we can get the second uh, coefficient, which is called the elliptic flow. So this basically tells us about the, the, the pressure driven uh, expansion. So for light flavor quarks, this V2 or second, uh, what we call as elliptic flow um, is explained quite well, especially at low PT using hydrodynamic uh, calculations. And this model predicts that the light quarks flows with the medium. Now, why is it interesting for heavy quarks? Heavy quarks are massive, as I mentioned, so they take longer to interact with the with the medium. So it would we would expect that they uh, it takes longer for them to thermalize. So the question is, do they thermalize? Is the interaction strength with the QGP strong enough for uh, for heavy quarks to thermalize, uh, or they don't thermalize because heavy quarks are produced isotropically uh, in hard scattering. Now, when they interact, whether they um, it's strong enough that the, the, the medium pushes heavy quarks with it and heavy quarks flows with the medium. So this is the question that is asked. And to, uh, to, uh, to see this, we measure the B2 um, of heavy flavor particles, for example, d mesons. So d mesons are made of charm and a light quark. So we can look at the V2 of pions shown in black here and compare the V2 of uh, d mesons. So before I explain the, the measurement, one thing to note is at low PT where we, where we can get information about thermalization or the, uh, or the flow effects, at higher PT, this anisotropy is mainly driven by uh, the path length dependent energy law. So what I mean is if particles travel or if quarks travel uh, longer, so for example, in this case, in a semi-central collision, uh, if, part tra if quarks travel along the long axis, it sees uh, longer, it has larger path length, so it loses more energy compared to quarks that travel along the short axis. So this would lead to an isotropy. And this is, this is something that we can see at higher uh, PT um, in, in the V2 measurement. So what we see is at low PT, the D meson V2 is smaller compared to light quarks, but at higher PT, the charm and light uh, flavor quarks uh, like particles have similar uh, V2. So the path length dependent energy law seems to be similar irrespective of the mass. Now the V2, the positive V2 could indicate that the charm quarks have uh, flow with the medium, so the interaction is quite strong. Or it could be also because uh, the V2 is coming from the light quark that the charm quark is, uh, is attached to in the, in the case of uh, mesons. So to get further information, we can look at the V2 of JFSI, which are CC bar uh, system. And here again, we see that the V2 is positive. So this indicates that charm quarks interact strongly with the medium and they also participate in the, in the, uh, in the expansion, with the collective expansion of the, uh, of the medium. Now, B quarks are more heavier than charm quarks. So the question is, is the interaction strength strong enough for the B quarks to flow? So this can be uh, studied by looking at uh, B, B, B2 or B uh, beauty hadrons. So we don't have a B plus to compare directly with D mesons. So the B um, mesons are the, uh, the quark, B quark with the light quark. But what we do have are uh, the B2 of uh, particles coming from the decay of B uh, hadrons. So for example, uh, electrons here, we also have uh, D mesons coming from B hadrons and, and the, the message is very similar. It looks very similar. So what we see is the B2 for electrons or uh, beauty decay particles are non-zero. While the V2 for upsilon 
is a zero in the in the measured momentum range, but with large uncertainty. So the question is still whether um, whether the V2 for light the B quarks is because of the partland and uh, dependent energy loss, or is it because of the uh, V2 carried by the light quarks? So this is still a question that needs to be answered. Okay, so for a while run two, we have um, precise measurement of charm quark, but for beauty, the question still remains um, if they are uh, heavy enough and maybe they don't uh, interact strongly with the medium, or it's not strong enough. So that's what we learned from the uh, we do measurements of heavy quarks. And I'm moving on to the next kind of measurement is the uh, nuclear modification factor or the RAA where we measure the transverse momentum distribution of uh, particles in lead light collision shown in red, just a cartoon. And then we compare it with proton-proton collisions where the proton-proton collisions are scaled up to the number of uh, average number of binary nucleus radius collisions. So if we take the ratio between the two, if there, if there is no medium effects, then we would expect that the RAA to be equal to one. But if there are uh, medium effect, if there is energy loss and the momentum has shifted, so the RAA will be lower than one. So for chunk quark, when we measure this, we see that the RAA is uh, lower than one, and the RAA uh, reduces, or the suppression, we can call this a suppression, and the suppression increases as we go from peripheral to more central collisions, indicating that uh, as we go to more central collisions, the produced quark blood plasma is bigger, uh, so chunk quarks lose more energy, hence we see a, a lower RAA value. Now, so one thing that I mentioned in the in the motivation was that using heavy quarks, we can study uh, if there is a mass dependent behavior in the interaction. So since we have charm quark RAA, we can compare with light quarks and see whether we see a mass dependent effects. And if we compare the RAA of D meson shown in black with the red or green, which, which basically um, is the RAA for light quarks such as pions or charged particles at high PD, but just understand it as, as uh, mainly uh, pions. We see that at low momentum, there is a difference where the RAA is higher for charm quark. So the question is whether to indicate charm quark loses less energy. Unfortunately, comparing charm quark and light quarks is not very easy because their production is very different. While charm quarks are produced in hot scattering events, light quarks can be produced later in the uh, 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 in the evolution of the system. So especially at low PP, we, this is not a one-to-one -one comparison. So in order to uh, compare or study mass dependent effects, a better way to compare is using charm and beauty quarks because both of them are produced in hot scattering events. So they, the, the production is very similar. So this can be done, or this is currently done, by looking at D mesons, is shown in red, and non-prompt D mesons. These are D mesons coming from B hadron D case, uh, which is shown in blue. And what we see is at uh, in this intermediate um, PT range, between 5 and uh, 20 GB, the RAA for beauty is higher. So this indicates that beauty quarks lose less energy compared to uh, charm quark. But again, but these are decay particles. That's something that, that we have to take into account. So there can be some decay kinematic effects that, that play a role. Uh, uh, but in any case, we clearly see a hint that beauty quarks lose less energy. So now that we have these measurement, um, to understand how heavy quarks uh, interact with the QGP uh, and study all the different effects, we need to compare with models. And one thing that we have to note is that for models to describe the data, they have to get different aspects correct. For example, they need to get the cold nuclear matter effect. There's a, the initial state of the collision should be implemented correctly, and they should have a realistic um, evolution of production and evolution of coagulant plasma, how heavy quarks interact with the coagulant plasma, and a realistic way of uh, how heavy quarks hadronize uh, later in the, in the process. So given all this complexity, and, and we have several models uh, here compared with the data, and instead of comparing one measurement, it's always better to compare uh, two measurements, for example, the RAA and B2 simultaneously, and see whether the data can describe both of them simultaneously. And what we see is uh, in the, the measurements are very precise compared to the models. Now the uncertainties in the models are much higher than, uh, than the data itself. Um, even then, 
the models fail to describe both RA and V2 simultaneously in a given centrality and in, in a given momentum range. So this would indicate that we need more differential measurements or uh, maybe uh, include beauty quarks to further constrain uh, the models. But all is not lost. Uh, though we have several uh, measurements, we can still understand some of the mechanisms uh, of heavy quark interaction. So one exercise that is done is to take a model which describes the data reasonably well and uh, switch on and off certain mechanisms in the model. For example, uh, we know that uh, the models include both collisional and radiative uh, processes um, for heavy quark interaction. So we can switch off radiative process and see how the, the RAA, how the model describes the RAA and, and BD. So what is seen is when we switch off uh, the radiative process, which is shown uh, here in blue. So the um, so let's let's take the blue versus magenta, which is the same model, one having both collisional and radiative process included, and the blue one switching off the radiative process. We see that at low momentum, it doesn't matter whether we have radiative process. While at higher momentum, radiative process becomes very important. That's when this uh, don't describe the data. So this indicates that at higher PT, radiative process dominates, while at lower PT, collisional process dominates. And we can do a similar thing for how heavy quarks uh, hadronize. So I'll come back to this later uh, to discuss further on hadronization process. Um, so what is done here is take a model which uses two different kinds of hadronization process. One is using uh, fragmentation and the other is coalescence. And we'll come back later on, on what they are. Uh, just uh, understand that the fragmentation is when the heavy quarks fragments to, and finally uh, produce stable hadrons. While in the case of coalescence, quarks uh, which are in similar phase space, they combine to form, uh, to form hadrons. And what we see is if we compare, uh, let's take um, a blue distribution where the dotted line does not include recombination effects and the blue solid line includes uh, uh, fragmentation and recombination effects, we clearly see that at low momentum, if the recombination effects are not included or coalescence is not included, it's the same uh, word used in different ways. Uh, we see that at, at lower momentum, the data is not described very well. So clearly indicating that at low momentum, hadronization via the combination of coalescence is very important. What about beauty? So I, I showed previously that uh, the B quarks lose less energy compared to charm quarks. But to understand how the models describe it, we can compare with models. Uh, but what is shown here is the ratio of the RAA for D mesons coming from B quarks to the uh, RAA of D mesons itself. And we see that the RAA is higher for B quarks, which is expected, but as, as what we see here, the B quarks lose less energy. But what is interesting is we see this, this PT dependence at low PT, where there's a dip and then it goes up again. And to understand why we see this dip, which is described by the models as well. So all, most of the models describe the dip. Uh, we can do the same exercise where we switch on and off certain mechanisms. And it turns out that it's because of uh, coalescence that we see the dip. So it changes the recombination effects, changes the PT distribution, it shifts the PT, giving this, um, this dip. Okay, so in the, the, the momentum becomes harder for D mesons because of the recombination. So since we have all the models compared to the data, uh, the model use uh, transport coefficients. So we can select those models to describe the data very well and look at the, uh, the spatial diffusion coefficient, for example, and see what is the range that the models give. And it turns out that using the ALICE data, RAA and V2 data, which are very precise, the current uh, range where the spatial diffusion coefficient is between 1.5 and 4.5, which is uh, quite good, but it's still quite large. It's, it, the, the, the range of the coefficient is quite large. So in order to further constrain the models, we, use, we need to use B quarks or more beauty hadron measurements coming uh, using our pre data. We can further reduce the uncertainty uh, of, the, of the models and also uh, have better constraints on the coefficient itself. Now that brings me to the next topic, um, which is called the angular correlations. 
So the RAA and V2 measurements, what we basically do is count particles in different momentum ranges. And, and what we are looking at is the change in the momentum distribution by um, calculating all the heavy quarks in, uh, on an average. So it's, it's an inclusive measurement in a sense. Now to further constrain or to understand how heavy quarks interact, we can, we can look at not just the momentum change in the momentum, but also directional change. So this is something that we can do by looking at the angular distribution of uh, heavy quark pairs. So for example, uh, CC bar pairs, we know in, in, at leading order, they're produced back to back. Uh, when, when they interact with the uh, QGP, um, depending on uh, how the, the path length of the, of the heavy quarks, it could change the direction. So this will, by looking at both the momentum change and also the directional change, we are constraining or we, are, we can better understand how heavy quarks interact with the Kogman plasma. Now, measuring uh, CC bar pair uh, correlation is extremely challenging because we need huge statistics. So the first step in the direction is, uh, was to look at uh, one of the heavy quarks and looking at uh, charge hadrons uh, on the opposite direction. So uh, basically, what we tag the trigger on one uh, heavy flavor particles and look at charge particles uh, both on the near side and the, uh, on the away side. So when we look at such a, a correlation measurement, we end up with a distribution that looks like this, where the near side corresponds to particles coming from the same jet, and on the away side will be particles coming from the opposite jet to the trigger particle. And we can learn uh, different aspects in, uh, in the quark work plasma, uh, which I'll come to that. So for the first, uh, step was to measure this correlation in proton-proton collision. And, and we know that at higher PT, heavy quarks produce a jet. So by looking at charged particles uh, on the near side and the away side, uh, we are looking at the jet profile and the composition of heavy, uh, heavy fluid mm -hmm. jets. So we measure this uh, using electrons. We also have this for D-mesons, but uh, and, and what we learned are very similar. So I'll show the, the measurements for electrons because we have the results in the dead collision for the electrons. So what we see is, so we get the, the delta phi correlation between the uh, flavor particle and charged particles. We see a peak on the near side and we see a peak on the away side, as I mentioned before. And to extract the properties and also to define the baseline, we fit this distribution um, using a one mysis uh, and a pedestal to describe the baseline of the correlation and then we can extract the, the peak properties. So when we calculate the yield and the width of the peaks, what is seen is um, the, on the near side, the yield that uses is a function of PT of the associated. So as we go to higher, if we look at higher PT uh, particles in the jet, the, the distribution falls, which is something that we expect. And then if we look at the width of the correlation peak, both on the near side and the away side, the width, the width seems to be independent of the PT, uh, both on the trigger and the associated. If we change the PT of the trigger or the PT of the associated, the width of the, the peak widths seem to be uh, similar. And this is uh, well described by PTR uh, calculations as well. And even in PLED, the distribution don't seem to change, so indicating that cold nuclear matrix uh, effects don't play a role in the correlation distribution or the fragmentation. Uh, of the jet itself. Now, in heavy ion collisions, we know that heavy quarks interact um, by elastic and inelastic process. But high PT uh, heavy quarks, where they produce jets, the jet itself can interact with the medium. So the constituents of the jet can be modified because of the uh, interacting uh, interaction with the medium. So the internal structure of the jet can itself modify. But also, on the other hand, it's a high PT jet going through the QGP. So there's energy put in by the jet to the medium. So the medium can itself uh, change. So the, these effects can be studied by looking at the correlation and uh, look, calculating the, the per trigger nuclear modification factor or the IAA, where we calculate the yield in lead lead collision and compare it or, the, or take the ratio with respect to proton proton collisions. And what we see is um, for correlations of heavy flavor electron and, and hadron. Um, so here is the delta phi distribution for two different associated uh, PT. The trigger PT is fixed for both cases. In black is what we see for lead lead collision and in red is uh, what we see for proton proton. And as you see, both on the near side and on the away side, 
for both associated PT, the correlation distribution seems to be different. So at low PT, we see this broadening effect on the away side, while at high PT, there is a clear suppression um, on the other side. And also on the near side, there is a change, especially at low PT. And to, in, in order to uh, extract uh, the, the peak properties more quantitatively, we can calculate the yield on the near side and other side, and then take the ratio and, and calculate the IAA. And when we do this, on the near side, what we see is the, the IAA is higher at low PT. So there is an enhancement of low PT particles in lead-lead collision compared to proton-proton on the near side at low PT, but at higher PT, the IAA is, uh, is consistent with one. But on the away side, there is an enhancement of low PT particles, but a suppression of high PT particles. Now, this could indicate the, on the away side, this could indicate that uh, the low PT enhancement could be because the lost energy is going into low momentum particles. And uh, uh, the high PT suppression is because of jet quenching and also maybe because of the geometric bias. So we are selecting the trigger particle more closer to the surface. So the, the opposite uh, uh, jet is traveling further in the, in the medium. So it undergoes more energy loss. Uh, and another interesting thing that was observed was the IAA for, uh, for heavy quark shown in green is very similar to the IAA of the light flavor particles though the trigger PT are different for heavy quark and for light flavor. And in fact, what we see is even if we change the PT of the trigger for heavy uh, flavor particles to go to higher PT, the IAA does not change. So it's independent of the trigger PT and it's only dependent on the associated uh, PT. Now to, to understand what's happening, what are the different effects? There are several things going on. It could be the wake effect, why we see this enhancement, or it could be the push of the, of the medium uh, by the jet. Uh, or it could be just energy loss where particles go from higher, uh, losing energy and going into low momentum particles. In order to understand this, we need to compare with models. But unfortunately, there are no models which includes a uh, heavy flavor, especially the, the Monte Carlo models, which can describe these measurements. So we are basically tracking down theorists <laughs> for, to get some predictions uh, for this measurement. Okay, so uh, let me move to the next set of measurements uh, where we study hadronization. So I previously mentioned about fragmentation and coalescence. So fragmentation is uh, where the models, are, basically it, we have phenomenological models which uh, describe fragmentation um, and they use E plus E minus data to, to parameterize the, the model. And then tends to describe the data in E plus and minus collisions, but there are limitations that we see in, in, uh, in head on head on collisions. So the other uh, way um, um, here quarks can hadronize is via uh, recombination, which is especially important in high density environments, such as uh, in the presence of coagulum plasma, but we also see this in proton proton collisions, where quarks, if they are in similar space, phase space, they combine to form hadrons. So the consequences, we can see this in this uh, diagram here. So if, if we have a 6 GV pion, if it's coming from a fragmentation process, then it is coming from a 10 GV quark fragmentation. But if the 6 GV pion is coming from recombination, then it's coming from two, it could come from two, three GV uh, quark. So that's the difference in, uh, in the, in the hydronization process. So a proton can come, if, if, if it's coming from a recombination process, then it could come from 3 to GV, for example. So that's the, uh, so it changes the momentum distribution uh, of the hadrons. And this will also impact <coughs> the anisotropy, that's with an anisotropy of hadrons, and we'll also expect an enhancement of baryons with respect to mesons. So to study this uh, with heavy quarks, so we have measured baryons containing uh, chump quark and, and compared it with uh, mesons containing chump quark. So lambda c over the, uh, lambda c and d zero. So what we do is uh, measure the PT distribution of lambda c and d zero and take the ratio. And what we see is the the ratio is um, much higher than what we expect from an E plus E minus collision. So the dotted line here is what we would expect from an E plus E minus, uh, what is measured in E plus E minus collisions. 
And, and that is what PTR Monash tune gives because that's tuned to be plus and minus data. But then there are models which include some sort of recombination effects, even PTR, which includes color uh, recorrection, which is kind of recombination. It basically allows interaction of quarks outside the jet uh, itself, uh, or interaction uh, of quarks in the jet with the underlying event. And uh, such uh, interactions describe the data much better. Now, uh, Alice has measured several heavy quark or uh, heavy flavor uh, baryons, there's lambda C, chi C, chi plus. So we can look at the fragmentation fractions. So what is shown here is the, the fragmentation fraction to different mesons and baryons compared to uh, E plus E minus and EP data. So the, the, dot, the, the, uh, the points without the box are the measurements from E plus E minus and, and EP, while the box corresponds to the measurement in PP collisions. We don't see a center of mass uh, energy dependence. So for 13 TV and 5 TV, the ratio is very similar. But what is significantly different with respect to E plus E minus is that the, the D0 ratio, uh, the fraction of uh, Chamco going to D0 is much lower in proton-proton like, -proton collisions compared to E plus E minus, while there is a significant enhancement of lambda C and other baryons. In fact, in E plus E minus, we haven't measured uh, other baryons, so we don't have it. So this clearly indicates that the fragmentation fractions are not uh, universal. So there is a, a, a dependency on the collision system itself. So what happens in PLEG collision? If we compare the lambda C over D0 ratio in PP to PLEG, you see that in PLEG collisions at low PT, the ratio is lower in PLEG compared to PP, but at higher PT, there is an enhancement. So this could be even considered as a shift in the uh, in the in the PT distribution and P light collisions, and if we go to LED light collisions, we see this uh, enhancement or shift even further. So in green is the PP, in uh, in blue is semi central LED LED, and red is uh, more central LED LED collisions. And we clearly see an enhancement or a shift at low PT. There is a suppression, and and uh, in this intermediate PT there is an enhancement. But at higher PT, it tends to go um, uh, to the values closer to E plus and minus. Collisions. And if we compare to models, uh, the all, we have three models which um, which uh, describes the baryon production in different ways. Well, the TAMU and the Tanya model both have um, incorporated coalescence or recombination effects, but in two different ways. And what we see is the TAMU uh, model describes the data uh, better compared to other other models. Now, um, so if we have since we have the measurement to very low PT, an exercise that can be done is to just integrate the lambda C and the D0 uh, PT spectra from zero PT to all the way to high PT uh, and compare the integrated value instead of PT differential value. And what we see is um, if we plot this ratio as a function of multiplicity uh, from, uh, from low multiplicity to all the way to high multiplicity going from PP to lead lead, central lead lead collisions. What we see is that while the ratio is higher compared to E plus E minus data, there is no multiplicity dependence. So this indicates that um, the baryons itself are not enhancing, but rather maybe the phase space is being shifted uh, among the box. So there is a shift in PT distribution, but there is uh, no enhancement as a function of multiplicity. At least that's what we see in, in this data. Of course, the uncertainties are larger, so we need, especially in the uh, semi-central uh, light light collisions. And we also need to go to much lower multiplicity to see whether it extrapolates to plus E minus at some point or it remains flat for uh, the data data collisions. And, um, and if we compare to models, uh, PTR8 expects uh, um, a dependency, a multiplicity dependence, while uh, Tamu and Katanya uh, shows that they are similar for PP and equities. So now to, uh, to further investigate um, baryon production, we can look at baryon production inside jets and see if the fra and, and look at the fra fragmentation function, for example, which is the fraction of momentum carried by the heavy flavor hadron with respect to the PP of the jet. So here uh, I show the PP of the charged jets. Uh, and, and PT of the, of the hadrons. For lambda C, 
tank jets shown in uh, gray or black points, and in blue is for the D0 uh, tank jets. And what we see is um, the, the fragmentation function is more softer because the peak for lambda C is toward the lower region compared to D mesons, which uh, tends to go to a higher uh, value. And if we take the ratio here, uh, the peak here and compared to model, we see that PTR8 uh, with Monash tune, which, uh, which is tuned for E plus E minus data, doesn't describe, so it predicts a harder fragmentation for lambda C than what we see in, in, in the data. But PTR8 with color reconnection mechanism uh, gives a better description. So it's it's softer. The uh, With color reconnection, the fragmentation function seems to be a bit more softer. Now we can further look at uh, heavy flavor jets uh, with big variants by looking at uh, angular correlations. So what we did was to um, compare the angular distribution for D-meson uh, triggered correlation and lambda C triggered correlation. So again, as a, as a reminder, on the near side, we, we are looking at charged particles in the same jet and, and the opposite side or the away side is the charged particle in the, in the, in the opposite jet. So the lambda C correlation shown in red is significantly different uh, compared to the meson uh, correlation or the meson triggered correlation, especially at low PP. And another interesting point is if we compare it with models, especially PTR uh, distribution for lambda C. So just to note, the dehedron correlation is well described by PTR uh, for all the tunes. The difference uh, between the tunes are very less. But when we look at lambda C correlations, PTR tunes, none of the PTR tunes describe the data, even the ones which tend to describe the lambda C over D0 ratio, and also the fragmentation function shown in the previous slide, it doesn't describe the correlation measurement. So, um, and we don't fully understand why the, the low PT hadrons are uh, more produced, so there's a, a more produced in the jet in, for the lambda C jet compared to D meson. Possibly this could be because of softer fragmentation. So the jets which have softer fragmentation have larger multiplicity. So this would uh, produce, or we have a higher probability of producing lambda C via coalescence. And maybe that's uh, inherently means the multiplicity in the jet is higher, giving uh, this effect. So this is something that we need to further investigate. So all the measurements that I showed here are from run two data. But not well, it mostly run two. Now we have run three with where the Alice experiment has several upgrades, especially to the inner tracker system, uh, which will allow us to make um, a beam as on measurement and also we can look at uh, more differential studies. So expand on the correlation and jet measurements and also jet substructure measurements. So that's basically what uh, we're looking forward to. So finally, that comes to my summary with enough time for discussion. Uh, heavy quarks are excellent folks to study the properties of curved on plasma, but not just uh, in, in heavy ion collisions, but also in proton proton collisions. We can learn quite a lot uh, about uh, hadron hadron uh, collisions. And what we have learned from the current measurement is that heavy quarks uh, undergo energy loss because of uh, in medium interactions. And charm quarks tend to thermalize, especially at low PT, and they participate in the collective expansion of the medium. And we have extracted a spatial diffusion coefficients with the current uh, measurement because they are very precise for the charm quarks, but we still need more measurements to further constrain uh, these values. And we have started looking into jet medium interactions for uh, using uh, angular correlations, and, and we clearly see an indication of uh, jet, jet modification in the, in the QGP. And we have several measurements to investigate hydronization via collisions. Uh, or coalescence or recombination, and we've seen that this is uh, dominant at low PT. So these are the, these, while we have several measurements and we understand a lot, it has opened up a lot of new questions. So we're excited about run three and run four data at LHC. Uh, and also we have S Phoenix at RIC, so this will give us new measurement. Exciting times, sir. Okay. Thank you. You're very nice. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, I guess I'm just trying to understand when you say charm quarks thermalize, that means they are not exclusively produced in the initial hard scattering. 
Is that uh, is that important? So um, uh, there, so uh, when 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 we say thermalized, it just means that the the velocity of the charm quark is similar to the to the medium. So they are part of the medium, but it doesn't mean that they are thermally produced. So um, I think uh, the the um, for the strange quarks, it's thermally produced because there is enough de uh, energy density in the coagulant plasma to uh, for say let's say a gluon can split into an SS bar. Well, that's not possible, or that's unlikely for a charm quark. It's it's uh, it's more heavier for QGP to produce thermally charms. Oh, you see the distinction. So you mean thermalized just mean it can move with the same velocity? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I guess another sort of like a conceptual question: uh, when you say you compare with models with and without radiative effects, uh, you mean like you turn off the effects of quarks radiating a gluon? Yes. Exactly. But why would that be uh, physical? It's, it's not, oh, but it's to see how important it is, whether uh, whether it plays 10% role or does it play 100% role, right? That's basically what we want to understand. If we, it's, a, this, it's not physical, definitely, but uh, at low PP, without radiative energy loss or without uh, heavy quarks radiating zones, it's the RAA is still consistent. So this indicates that low PT uh, heavy quarks are not radiating or they are not dominant. This is what we understand. But when at higher PT without radiative energy loss, the, 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 the collisional process is not significant. So that's not the dominant way how heavy quarks are losing its energy. Thank you. Yeah, great talk, Deepa. Thanks. Uh, you get on to slide 27. Feeling a little bit slow today. So, this is an yeah. interesting question. You mentioned here that on the away side for IPT associated, we have suppression of the peak. Yeah. Right? But yeah. It, it's also, it looks like it's also in PP. So, in PP, okay. So, I think this, this uh, that's why uh, I, this is a better okay. plot where we see, uh, if we take the integrate the yield. Uh, and then take the ratio, uh, the high PP yield is lower than one, indicating a suppression. But, and and uh, you can also compare low PT and high PT, the black points where we clear C, yeah. C kind of a, a peak. It's also broad on the other side at low PT, but at high PT, clearly there is no peak. When we would expect that uh, uh, higher PT, the, the peak would become most, uh, uh, clear, more evident, but that's that's not to be the case. So, so what is going on in PP? In PP, PP is actually totally fine. Uh, I mean, this is is, is what uh, it's the normal fragmentation process. There is no suppression that we see in PP, and actually the peak distribution is well described by PTR. So, and it would be we try to extract the the width. To see if uh, the peaks are broadening, but unfortunately, uh, deciding on a, a function that describes the away side peak is turned out to be extremely complicated. Uh, for PP, we could easily put uh, a one mysis or even a Gaussian, a generalized Gaussian on the away side, but this was impossible in that direction. The shape is totally different in, in that side compared to PP collisions. Okay. Yeah. When you were talking about these recombination effects and hydronization mechanisms, um, you were showing how some of these hydron flavors match E plus E minus, but lambda C and D zero don't. Is is there well, what was the reason why lambda C and D zero in particular these enhanced effects from? Uh, so so what I meant was. The, the lambda C over D0 ratio in PP is significantly different from plus and minus. Yeah, yeah. But there were also chart you showed with different pattern flavors, but other ones are fine, right? Uh, you mean this one? Yeah. This one, okay. Why is it just particularly lambda C and D0 again? Okay, so... Um, there is intuitive way to understand. So the lack, so the probability for baryons to be produced in plus and minus is was much less. 
So what was and and also the way um, it's the it's also the way that we calculate the fragmentation function or the fragmentation fraction. This is experimentally driven, right? So we we can we have the total CC bar cross section, and then uh, um, we calculate this fraction based on how what is the uh, cross section for charm to go to D zero. So if we have measured D zero D plus uh, D sub S and lambda C, and and that gives the total cross section, and this is distributed in the fragmentation function. So now we measure, so we measure lambda C to be high, more uh, more produced in PP collisions compared to E plus this. Now this has to come from somewhere because it is normalized to the total cross section. So what is happening is, uh, and, and we know that uh, a larger fraction of uh, Chamco goes to D0. So uh, even though D plus and B sub S, maybe th there is a reduction, but a significant change is uh, seen in the D plus ratio. So the charm cock instead of going uh, to D zero, it would that there is a, a different channel that it goes to all the variants, which is less likely in the case of uh, E plus E minus. Is there also a reason why you want to look at them in ratio instead of independently, like when you? We can look at the PT uh, differential cross section, the cross section measurement itself. Mm -hmm. um, or you are looking at lambdas. Over D zero. So D0. There, there is the, okay. The, the, there is a there was a fundamental assumption that the fragmentation functions were universal. So it did not de it doesn't depend on the center of mass energy and it does all it doesn't depend on the collision system. So this that that's why all the models use the plus e minus to uh, to parameterize the heterization to PP collisions. So this measurement actually shows there is no universality. That was the motivation for this plot. Oh, okay, I'm very concerned. If fragmentation function, the fragmentation breaks. <laughs> are we sure that the E plus, E minus, and EP ones are fully corrected for the feed downs? <laughs> because that would explain a lot. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, would, it, it would be taken into a, so the, they haven't measured higher state as well. Yeah, but. Just because it's, you didn't measure it, it doesn't mean it was there. At Rick, at Rick, so the baryons are not. So if we look at, uh, I have it in the backup. So even the total cross section at LHC, okay, I think I don't have it in the backup. Uh, at LHC and at Rick um, are different just because the baryons are not taken into account in the total uh, uh, cross section calculation. But the feed down would not play such a thing. But I, I don't know. But just to make sure the fragmentation function is not an observable, right? It's so so I, I meant fragmentation fraction. I keep yeah. misspelling it. Just, I, I meant fragmentation fractions, which is an experimentally evaluated one, which is an input to the fragmentation function. Yeah, I have a bunch of questions, but we can do it in later. But on slide, maybe a couple of slide 22. So here, I mean, from all of these measurements, can you get a value for D sub S? Is that, is that the, what is D sub S to start with the diffusion coefficient, yeah. right? Yes. So can you get a value and a, an error bar for it. That's uh, so the, at, this calculation is for at, at PC equal to one point five NeV. Uh, so all we need to do is uh, just normalize it to get the least of S value, and the uncertainty would be based on basically the, the spread. So you just look at it and yeah. figure it out yourself. Okay. Um, and and okay, calculated maybe a. You didn't mention you mentioned early on cold nuclear matter, but you didn't say anything about it. Is there anything you want to say about it? Uh, so it wasn't so uh, it wasn't very in I felt okay, I didn't need it as a uh, to go through this except for maybe the RAA is not so what we see in RAA is not because of cold nuclear matter effects. Uh, because we see the the ratio is consistent with unity at least at higher PT 
indicating co-nuclear matter effects are not giving the, the, the ratio of the suppression. Uh, but do you mean any, anything in specific? I mean, have you, do you intend to measure, have you measured P-lead when you look at heavy quartz in particular for Kalania? The production, so, uh, okay, let me, uh, we have the measurement for in PLED. Um, you mean for the RA? I'm just asking if you want to compare it, if you want to look at lead, lead, look at uh, part time energy loss of heavy quartz, then okay. want to look in PLED and see if there's Cold nuclear matter effect that you would have a good count for. So when we are looking at in the in the in the mid rapidity region, this is it's not as much, but in the larger and forward and backward rapidity, it significantly plays a role. So we see a suppression in the forward rapidity and then a slight enhancement in the backward rapidity. And this is because of cold nuclear matter effects. But even if we take that into account, um, in, in the heavy ion collisions, we see a suppression. Sure. Beyond the cold yeah. matter effect. Yeah, I'm just wondering yeah. what one might anticipate, you know, looking towards the IC or anything. Uh -huh. And then, in fact, we see such effects even for open heavy flavor at forward and backward, but measured from, uh, by LHCD. This is that Alice cannot measure um, heavy quark or D mesons at forward. So we have the muon measurement. We again see some cold nuclear matter effects. Uh, but then we, in lead lead, it's further, the suppression is very, very clear. Um, so you also mentioned run three, and I assume that you might extend these correlation measurements where you do heavy flavor ad run correlations, I mean, back to back mm -hmm. to heavy flavor, heavy flavor correlations yes. to really see what that backward region looks like for when you have a heavy flip for the same trigger. Yeah. What happens to the uh, yeah okay yeah but you intend um, to do that but statistics are insufficient now so uh in run three we can definitely do it for pp uh it's not very clear if we can do d d d0 and d0 or d and d uh there are attempts being made so now we are in pp collisions there are people trying to measure this maybe it's possible but uh, an easier way is to look at uh, using electrons or tag uh, one of the flavor with an electron because you have higher branching right. ratio yeah. and then the sun. heavy ion collision, so it would be a more challenging. So maybe run four. I doubt we can do this in run three. But even in PP, there are questions to answer because uh, if we look at angular correlation, while many of the PQCD calculations describe PT distribution, but not uh, the angular distribution or delta eta, delta phi, and, and delta r measurements that um, the CMS has. Uh, I'm going to take you back to your slide 30 again, where you have this plot on the right with the actual fractions, or I guess like the shear fraction of the person. So here, so ignoring all the key points here, and then slowly looking at the different GP, I mean, clearly if you compare like a D0 and you compare that shared fraction with that of like the D sub S, one can say that the D sub S is quote unquote suppressed in terms of production, right? Compared to to the D zeros from here. Yes. Great. So I guess like where, where I wanted to take this is so the friends are LHCP have shown rather subject, I mean suggestive results where they do a multiplicity scan comparing the production cross sections of the D sub S to that mm -hmm. D zeros. And they seem to suggest that there is an enhanced production of D sub S relative to D zeros uh, in the PP system. So I'm curious as to, from the OE side, going forward, whether or not there are any attempts at, I don't wanna say reproducing this analysis, but performing the same type of analysis, and maybe even expanding it to the beauty sector, so comparing the D sub S to the zero. Because I'm, I'm not entirely sure if anybody's trying to look at this production mechanism difference at OE. So uh, for beauty, we haven't done it because we could not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but we have measurement of D sub S as a function of uh, multiplicity with respect to D0. So, well, the uncertainty is larger compared to what LHCB has. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't see, within the uncertainty, we don't see a multiplicity dependence. It's flat. It's flat. Yeah. 
And also there is a tension between LHCB and ALICE measurement for the lambda C K drop, uh, lambda C over D0 ratio. So there's also a story, no? Like uh, the, the ratios are different when you compare it to what a Lisa's might be. I think what you also showed it in your plan where like the, the star one sitting way up here. I don't have that picture on top of my head. Yeah. Maybe you can chat about it later, but it's just something that I'm curious about just because it's not so friendly. Beauty, measuring beauty definitely is, is in, yeah, it's, the hope is to do in run three months. Okay. Oh. Since you have this up, I've always been curious to ask a heavy flame folk. Alex Bay Cagney says, oh, fragmentation isn't universal. Next slide. What's <laughs> this caused like horror <laughs> in I, particle physics? I mean, they use fragmentation as their baseline for measuring all backgrounds. And we're saying, we don't know what it is. Like, it's like, it's like everybody just says, all right. <laughs> well, I mean, if charm isn't fragmenting normally, why would light box? So why do we claim we know anything? <laughs> and if it's not, why should charm be the only thing that's... It's, it's charm is not behaving differently compared to light box. So if we compare the lambda c over d0 to lambda over k on, it's exactly the same behavior. Right, and we said that's because there's baryon number. I don't know, we didn't declare that fragmentation was unknown to theorists. Feels like, like, don't the particle theorists like react with horror? I would think it's fundamentally broken. The fact that PTI has all the different color reconnection modes was because of uh, our uh, measurements, right? The, the lambda C measurement not agreeing with the plus C minus. It feels like there is a change uh, that they have incorporated it. But it's true that it hasn't. Uh... But when you would talk about the color reconnection modes, is this already including these new ropes shoving? Yeah. And okay, so yeah. that, those yes. are the ones yes. which, because the, the classical color reconnection one was a different one. So the uh, so the the the, the motto is it's not just color reconnection, but what box or uh, what patterns uh, reconnect. So the mode two, if I remember correctly, allows uh, color reconnection between partons in a jet to an underlying. So things which are not related uh, can also interact with each other. That is the, the enhancement. Also, in in the light particle realm, you don't call it by mode. You call it either ropes shoving or whatever the other version of that one is junction mix yeah it, it, it's included in all the modes it's just yeah it's, it's just that the, the naming scheme is confusing if yeah. if we don't if, if not even with an Alice we are consistent I think something might need to change <laughs> but we at least among us know which ones <laughs> <laughs> yeah Well, we didn't measure E plus E minus, we took the measurement from E plus E minus. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so your claim is that. So the, the uh, okay, what this plot is basically saying is <laughs> we have C, 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 a charm cox produced. What's the probability that the charm cox hit rise to D0 versus uh, a lambda C versus some other uh, hit rise? Claim that it's different. Yes, exactly. So if I just the fraction itself is different. So could you not just claim that it's TT driven? So like maybe the energy of the, the energy of a chunk of produce in one type of vision is maybe different. So it's it's not entirely energy de uh, dependent because that, that's why we compare. 13 TB and 5 TB. So here the energy is different. So the PT spectra is different, right? But so this this fraction is independent of the center of mass energy. And this is something that was checked before, and that's what I think led to the belief that it is universal. Uh, the difference is in a in a hadron hadron collision versus an electron hadron collision. Why just have a fork sitting here? Uh -huh. it, if it if it like somehow the like if the claim is that there's some interaction between P and E plus and minus it's there and it's if you just have a fork sitting here then there's no reason why it's just like it is decaying one way just like so crazy. I guess there's some there's some or maybe like 
So like heavy ion maybe it's interact in plus what's interest. Right. Yeah. Either way, like like somehow he knows it came from E plus minus. Let's see, let's see. Is it that it knows it came from E plus or E minus, or the environment is different, right. which allows charm to behave differently, or, or it, it's surrounded by more particles in one case compared to uh, in, in, in PP? That wouldn't be the fragmentation of all mm. Yes, that would change the PT spectrum, wouldn't it? Versus what it turns into. I mean, you're right that the color reconnections may be allowed because there's a dye plot going on, but that's not really then changing the fragmentation functions if you're just so adding then, other diagrams. But if we are, so uh, the, the number of C quarks produced are the same, right? If that's, that's the total cross section. Right. And now, depending on whether the charm is surrounded by more hadron, so it has now there's a phase space available for it to become a, a baryon instead of becoming a meson. So that would mean instead of this, without that environment, it would have become a meson. Now uh, with hadrons around it or part partons around it, it becomes a baryon. So this changes the fraction. So then there's enough that that's what background in PP for this to happen is the claim? Sorry? The, uh, so that, that there's enough background in multi-particle interaction PP for this to happen is... But that means what I'm... Uh, it's it's not, much, it's not, you're not saying it's extra scattering is so uh, it's just that. So my question is: uh, is, is there any interest in doing this as a function of multiplicity in the event? Because we've seen potential collective effects in high multiplicity PP before. So maybe could that so have anything? So this to this plot indicates that it's not a multiplicity event. Oh right, I forgot. It. Okay, yeah. Maybe a comment yeah. just because we kind of got stuck in the quagmire of fragmentation. Um, and and Helen's comment was an interesting one because you know originally that's why there's there's uh, factorization right fragmentation was something over here that the theorist actually didn't care about so you know it was something that became empirical that just got added on and you know by the particle physicists when they met made the measurements. Um, but then all of a sudden, the discussion, I think only with heavy ions or with nuclear physics came to, uh, you know, how do you make different types of particles, right? Hadronization. And so now there's what used to be fragmentation now is complicated by, you know, how do you, make particles of different types. And the theorists didn't care about that. You know, now, I would say 15 years ago, we started talking about how do you make particles when you fragment or what the final state looks like, and what is Saturnization. And really, the high energy physicists didn't care. So that was my. That's true, but like, they, I guess, we claim we understand enough to do these ultra precision beyond the standard model, and apparently we can't fragment to a linear. Too low energy. It's a fundamental calculation that theorists want to get involved in. You start talking about color robes and shoving and stuff like this, you know. It's not something that I've seen them go and say, okay, we're going to calculate this on a fund of series. Yeah, I agree, but like it's, I just I think it's a very curious, right? But it's not, because it's like, okay, really, we don't know what we end up with, and that's what we end up with. Right? Probably it's because baryons are so much, uh, the fraction is so much smaller, and they don't care about baryons, and, and with the mesons, the, the, but my mesons is a factor of nearly. Yeah, yeah, I, it's cool. I mean, I, I, I got the result. It's just sort of it could, it could also be that if you look at this ratio at higher PT, where the high energy physicists are basically interested only in higher high PT stuff, 
there it doesn't matter much. It's at the locality where all the hydrization and the different uh, ways it hit, uh, fox hydrides seem to matter much. So Maybe it's the PT that they're, they're looking at high, very high PT particles where uh, these effects don't play a role. The, I mean, the I mean fragmentation <laughs> function factorization requires high PT scale. So yeah. maybe what you're saying has actually no inconsistency at all. Yeah. yeah. QCD factorization requires high far scale. And I think what you're seeing so even charm quark at low PT is a hard scale. Yeah. I mean you still have at low PT, you still have high higher power. I don't, think we don't care about charm as much as B. Uh, and, and what does this actually yeah, look in the B sector? My suspicion is going to be very similar. Since we don't see difference between lambda over K0, it's very similar distribution for lambda C over D0, but it's something we'll see. I, I mean, what we see even for the very light particles like the pi zero and the eta, mm -hmm. what we see is as a function of center of mass energy, we see the eta to pi zero ratio going down even at high momentum. So it's not universal. It, it, there is a clear trend, even in Pythia, mm -hmm. it's saying, hey, it goes down. However, it is not because the one of them is produced more than the other. It is actually because we are accounting for different particles feeding into those measurements because none of us ever corrected for the stronger case. And that is making a massive dive. If you if you look at it, if you look in the actual jets, that's an even stronger dive. So it, it goes from 0.6 down to 0.4 within a few jet PT bins. So, so looking at this differentially as function of the jet momentum, might be the answer which you're looking for because that might be something in the feed down which is changing which does this to you because that, that's what we now figured out for the past years because we were like, how the hell is this changing so much and why is it changing in high multiplicity pp and then it started clicking okay yeah if you are going to high multiplicity pp most likely there was a massive jet somewhere and you are actually seeing the fragmentation of the jet, which most likely came if it comes from a massive jet from a higher order state. So, think. so the interpretation with, with heavy quarks, especially with the jet, whether it came from a jet versus a non-jet, it's complicated because heavy quark, it's, it's, it's produced in hard scattering, right? So it, it comes with an jet. So it's very difficult to distinguish from a non-jet but, but even for us, it's not an underlying event feature. It's what was the original quark having as an initial momentum. Because if the momentum of the jet was only 5 GeV, you cannot produce a 5 GeV eta out of that. There's no way. <laughs> you can also not produce a 5 GeV rho out of it. So there will not be any feed down from the row into the pi zero at 5 GeV. Stuff like this is playing a more and more sufficient role. If yeah. you, the, the more open you get in phase space, the more massive this, these effects get. And, and I'm wondering whether you see something similar just in a different realm. Because in E plus E minus collisions, you might never have seen this. You cannot. If the measurement of E plus E minus is not complete, right? Yeah. We have data we could, could look at now, right? Oh. It's like relook at it. Yeah, but E plus E minus, you might never never had enough statistics to do that. Uh, okay. Because I mean, E plus E minus was at the Z mass. What does this allow in terms of being not that many? <laughs> That's true. Not that many. And then, That's true. So, so if, if one looks at the heavier stuff, mm, not sure. <laughs> and even in the e, in in the B factories, I mean, you are producing it at pretty much the die B mass. Mm. They, 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 there won't be a jet which has a uh, hundred GeV. <laughs> There's a B in it. <laughs> Can't have that. <laughs> 
We are we are sufficiently past two p.m. Yeah. Uh, so, any more pressing, urgent questions for Deepa? If not, then I suggest that we thank Deepa.